view it's a teachable moment on fresh fire gospel radio that is the way we are going to be doing it this morning so guys we are going to be introducing in a short while minister kevin ellie ewing on fresh fire gospel radio and you know we know that while physical food is necessary for our physical growth and strength many of us as christians overlook the necessity of feeding our spiritual man with the word of god while this is so we all know that man will perish for a lack of knowledge and we seek to give you knowledge here with minister kevin l.a ewing and i say good morning to you mr kevin l.a ewing good morning to you also and the uh, fire fresh fire gospel crew Yes, welcome, welcome to Fresh Fire Gospel Radio, where a lot of the listeners have been waiting in anticipation for this moment. So we, <laughs> we're going to be just uh, giving you the mic straight off the bat. You have England, St. Lucia, the US, Canada, uh, West Africa, South Africa. Um, you also have Barbados, Jamaica, Guyana <laughs> in the house. I'm going to check and see who else is there. So, yes, uh, Minister Ewing, it's all yours. Okay, beautiful. First, again, I want to say thank you uh, for the invitation, Jackie. Thank you for your crew that has made this possible. And to be quite honest with you, uh, I couldn't wait to get on to share this uh, powerful word of God. This, this morning, I want to speak very briefly about the spiritual world and the reason why i decided to take this route is there's something that i've noticed quite a bit in the world of christianity and that is a lot of people uh, do not know what they signed on to when they accepted jesus christ as their lord and savior while the majority of us know that it was a matter of getting our souls right which is basically getting our insurance when we depart this world to uh, to be permanently on the other side of the spiritual world. We just see it that way, but we don't see the spiritual implications that comes along with it. So I decided to give this uh, brief teaching this morning so that everybody would be on board as to uh, what they signed on to and how exactly do you uh, operate in this world. Firstly, we live in a world where we coexist with spirits. There's no two ways about it, all right? Uh, if you say you are a Christian or a believer of Christ, Jesus, uh, God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and so on, what that simultaneously means is that you have subscribed to a world that you cannot see. You've never seen Jesus. You've never seen the devil. You've never seen angels. You've never seen demons. You've never seen heaven, you've never seen hell, and all of these things that the Bible speak about, it's speaking about it from a spiritual or an invisible perspective, all right? We, the believers of Jesus Christ, once we would have come on board, it should be our goal to learn as much as we possibly could about the unseen world, which is the same as the spiritual world or the invisible world. Because ultimately, this is where we're going to spend eternity when we transition from this material or physical world into the spiritual world. All right. Secondly, aside from us coexisting among spirits, when we read the Bible, we will quickly discover that this physical world is not where it all began. In fact, the Bible is very clear in Genesis chapter 1 when it described how God created the world. And the reality is he made this physical world out of things that cannot be seen, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. So therefore, everything has its origin, okay? Everything has its initiation or its beginning in the unseen world, okay? This is, again, let me put a pin in this. This is imperative. This is important. This is the core of your Christianity because if you do not grab a hold of this, this very crucial and essential understanding, you could be living a form of godliness or waging battles with things that are insignificant as it relates to your spiritual journey. Okay? So therefore, the spiritual world, okay, 
is the parent world to our physical world. And everything that happens here was conceived or created or manufactured from that world over there. Now, the rules are, according to Genesis again, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, it is clear that God, when he completed this his creation and he made the, the, the garden uh, for Adam and Eve, the Bible says that he handed the keys or the authority for this world to Adam and Eve. He says, okay, now, here, you dominate, you be fruitful, you multiply, you subdue. I'm giving you the authority. And the rules here is he never gave any spiritual being the authority to dominate and to rule this earth. He gave it to mankind. And mankind would be you and I, spirit, soul, and body, triune being, right? Now, With that said, because he never gave authority to the spirits such as angels, such as demons, such as the devil, watch this, and even himself, he didn't give it to himself. He said, I've created everything. I've made a garden eastward of Eden. And listen, Adam and Eve, I'm going to put you here. And now you take the key. You manage whatever is going to go down on this earth. You are going to be the one who have authority over it. So with that said, The scriptures are showing us that authority was solely given to mankind, never to spirits. Hence, it brings about this next spiritual rule. In order for any spirit, be it the spirit of the kingdom of darkness or the spirits of the kingdom of light, to participate in the events of this physical world, the way that God set it up, there has to be an agreement between the spiritual realm and mankind. No spirit, including the spirit of God, can impose its will on earth. Now, I know what you're saying right now. Now, what is this guy talking about? God who created everything. You're going to tell me God need permission from man? No, I didn't say that to you. What I'm saying to you, in God's rules, this is what we're looking at. It isn't a matter of man being superior to God and God have to consult with man. No, that's the way you're looking at it. Looking at it from a rule perspective, God is saying, I am giving you authority. That's just like if you have a kid, okay? Your kid now got married and you said, hey, look, your son, this is your house. I'm giving you the key to it. Now, even though you gave that child the key and give them authority, and yes, it, it, you were the one that built the house, but you still have to ask that child's permission to come into the house because you transferred the authority of that home to the child. It isn't that the child is greater than you. It isn't that the child is superior than you. It is a matter of rules and regulations that are put in place to bring about a determined end result or to bring order. Okay, so every spirit now, whether it's a sorcery, witchcraft, whether it's a a praise, whatever, whatever spirit is going to participate in this or have the freedom that is to operate in the earth they have to consult with mankind to forge an agreement which is which which is what the bible speak heavily about which is we know to be covenants okay so that mean now every time we want help from god what do we do well we pray we fast we intercede why are you doing these things why don't you say, God, come on over here, man. Let's come to, come do this for me. No, because this is the protocol. And we're doing this by going to his word, which is God, according to uh, St. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. And verse 14 of that same chapter says that Jesus Christ, which was the word, became flesh. So we, in order to invoke God, we must come in agreement with his word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Okay. So God, who is a spirit, because that's what his word is, God, who is a spirit, every time we agree with the word of God, we are agreeing with a spirit. As a result, we have met the prerequisite to give God the right to intervene into our affairs. Very clear. Now, because this is the principle for the entire earth, then this also works in the kingdom of darkness. This is why people who are into the occult, who are into witchcraft and sorcery and voodoo and so on, 
They just cannot go there and say, hey, look your evil spirit. Come go and harass this person. No. Hence, they have rituals. They have ceremonies. Why? Because there has to be an agreement between the spirits and the human being. Because by right, the spirit itself does not have the right to come and do what they want to do. And we ought to thank God for this because if this was the case, a spirit of poverty, a spirit of insanity, a spirit of whatever could have just automatically jump on you. They cannot do it. Hence, we have such uh, phrases as generational curses and so on and so forth, because there are protocols and procedures that has to be met by that evil being in collaboration with a human being to birth or produce their good, if it's from the kingdom of light, or their evil, if it's from the kingdom of darkness. Very clear. So ultimately, there are two kingdoms. Now, this is the part I want you to get. However, these kingdoms are not tangible. They're not visible. They're not something you can touch. These kingdoms are in the spiritual realm. So very quickly, I want us now to turn to Matthew chapter 12. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12 because we want to extract some nuggets here to support everything that I'm saying. And any of you that follow me, you know I'm the scripture guy. I do not say squat unless I am bringing the scripture to support what I say because I don't believe in talking nonsense and spitting out riddles. I am going to give you exactly what that Bible says. And now I'm leaving it up solely to you to believe or disbelieve. All right. So let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 12. And we want to specifically look at verse 25, <coughs> excuse me, verse 25 to verse 28. And just to give some background here, uh, Jesus had just healed uh, this particular guy. I think he had a withered hand or something like that. And the Pharisees and religious leaders of that time accused Jesus of being a juju man or a rich doctor because they said that the only reason why he had the power to heal this guy was because he was uh, of Beelzebub, which means the Lord uh, of the flies, all right? So Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 25, we're going to read to verse 28. And it says, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom, this is a principle now, every kingdom divided or opposes itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Okay, we get that. Listen to verse 26 of Matthew 12. And if Satan casts out Satan, meaning he's opposing that of his own, he is divided against himself. Listen, listen. How shall then his, listen to the key word here, kingdom stand? So the scripture in conveying the principle of when a house or people or organizations or whatever are opposing one another, the principle is here is that they can never go forward. Eventually, they will just uh, be defeated. They'll just fall to the ground and not produce. But in this principle, we now see some information that we never knew before prior to this. And what is that? It's revealing to us that Satan has a kingdom. However, this kingdom is in at a physical location in the sense that I could say to you, okay, go to this particular corner, make a left, and just go straight ahead. And you're going to see a yellow, big, entire complex in that Satan kingdom. No. So the scripture is telling that Satan has a kingdom. And there can be no kingdom without a king. So clearly he is the head of his kingdom. Now watch this now. So it goes on to say here uh, in verse 27 of Matthew 12, it says, and if I, this is Jesus still speaking, if I by Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies, cast out devils or demons, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. Verse 28. But if I cast out devils, listen now, listen, by the spirit of God, uh-huh, then the then the what? Then the kingdom, then the kingdom of God is come unto us. So the scripture has just unfolded to us human beings 
who know very little of the spiritual realm, that there are two kingdoms in the invisible world, the spiritual world, or the unseen world, all synonymous with each other. There is the kingdom of light, and then there is the kingdom of darkness. But I want to make unequivocally clear before we go any further, by no stretch of the imagination are, are these kingdoms equal. I'm going to take it a step further, and I know a lot of religious folks are going to become offended, but the only reason why you're offended is because you don't understand these things. Not only are they not equal, but it is the power from the kingdom of God that, give, that gives the kingdom of darkness and every other kingdom the power to exist. For you to say otherwise, then you're saying to me there's another creator outside of God. So when we get a hold of these understanding, it's taking our Christian journey to a different level. It's taking us to a whole new different level because we don't just look at the surface anymore. As believers, we ought to be trained intensely about the invisible realm. Why? Because this is the, this is the grounds that we are waging war on. We, everything that we are doing here is preparing us that when we die, when all death is, is a separation of our human spirit and soul that will depart from this fleshly body uh, indefinitely. It's going to be extracted. And now we're going to be uh, transitioned into the invisible world. And that is where we're going to spend eternity. So if we haven't made our election sure or accepted Jesus Christ, then it ain't going to look good for you. Right? Now, I just said to you, or reveal to you in scripture, these two kingdoms, right? Now, what I want us to do now is I want us to quickly to go over to uh, uh, to Second uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, all right? Because the apostle Paul here is now about to give us some more spiritual insight, okay? And in and, and, and his teachings, he is adamant about trying to get the believers of Corinth, the believers of Galatia, and wherever he went to look at life as a believer of Jesus Christ from a spiritual perspective, okay? You shouldn't be focusing on your physical enemies. You should be focusing on the, the, the physical uh, adverse stuff happening to you. The more you get into your spirituality as it relates to Christianity, you are going to quickly discover that there is an invisible force behind that uh, troublemaker behind that enemy. There are spirits such as the spirit of jealousy, the spirit of poverty, the spirit of hate, the spirit of anger, the spirit of unforgiveness. See, these are the real forces behind whom you have labeled as your physical enemy. So the reality is when you put your focus on this your mother, who you haven't spoken to in years, your brother or sister who offended you 10 years ago, and you as a believer of Jesus Christ, do not blow breath to them because of the offense that they levied upon you. My friend, listen to me and listen to me well, okay? The only thing you are doing is you are um, filling out all of the right questionnaires or that application to find yourself in a Christless hell because you are in fact violating the laws of the living God as we are about to see. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 18 and listen to Apostle Paul's advice to the church of Corinth. He said, while we, who is this we? We the believers of Jesus Christ, we who have signed on that we accepted Jesus Christ as the son of the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he says, while we look not at the things which are seen, do not become focused on the physical things of this world. Do not become caught up in the hunger for money and greed and material things and, and trying to uh, accomplish the next whatever. No, he says, do not look at the things which are seen. Instead, he says, but at the things, focus on the things which are not seen. Whoa, 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 back up, Mr. Paul. What are you talking about? How can I focus on something that I cannot see? Well, he's referring to the spiritual world. Well, still, how do I see it? You delve into the scriptures like we're doing right now, and we yuck out those nuggets that refer specifically to the unseen world. 
such as the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light that we cannot see. So we search the scriptures about more information concerning these invisible entities so that we will be better equipped to be successful on our Christian walk, dismissing the physical distractions that's trying to garner our attention and focusing on the spirit behind them. My Lord, you see, I love this. This is just getting too juicy. It says, why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. He now is about to go into to, to, to detail. He says, for the things which are seen are temporal. Why are you focusing on the supervisor who's giving you hell on the job? Okay, being spiteful and vindictive. When are you as a believer going to take your authority in Jesus Christ and come against the spirits that dominating that human? The spirit of spitefulness, the spirit of revenge, the spirit of hate that they have, or even yourself. Why don't you deal with the spirits on you? Huh? The spirits of unforgiveness, the spirit of selfishness. Remember what I opened up this conversation with, this teaching with. We as believers and human beings on the whole, we coexist with spirits even though we don't see them. And we open up ourselves to them when we go against the laws of God. This is when they have the right to now invade our lives. Because we, whenever we agree to the word of God, let me be clear. Whenever we agree to the word of God, by default, we are in agreement with the spirit of God. And now we will see the manifestation of God. Just like I told you the rules. When a human agrees with a spirit, that is when those things that are spiritual are able to transition or manifest into this physical realm. Therefore, the rule is also on the flip side. When we disagree with the word of God or rebel or go against it, by default, by default, the enemy has his right to come into our lives and levy his curses. Just a sidetrack, just for a little bit, and we're coming right back to this point here in 2 Corinthians 4 and 18. The Bible says, according to Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning at verse 1 to verse 2, and he says, if you, I'm going to paraphrase it, if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and to observe to do all his commandments. The first thing he said, I'm going to do because you agree with my word, which is a spirit, which is God himself. He says, I will set you on high. I will promote you. That's the first sign you know the things that I have promised you is going to now take place in your life. There's going to be an elevation. And for the most part, that elevation isn't physical. It's an elevation in the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of understanding, according to Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. All right? He says, I'm going to elevate you. Now watch what he does next. He says, again, all of this is predicated on the condition that you observe to do the laws of God and to do it his way. He says, I will bless you in your body, bless you in the field, bless you in your storehouses. He says, in your going out and your coming in, you will be blessed. Your enemies will come in one way, but they got to scatter seven different ways from you. Then he goes down to, to, to uh, verse 12 of Deuteronomy 28 and says how he's going to open up his treasures and release more blessings to you. All of this is by default. When we agree with the word of God, ladies and gentlemen, I am submitting to you the word of God and I'm saying to you, you have read nothing in there. There is no other condition. There is no gimmicks. There's none of that foolishness. Obey the word of God and by default, you don't have to ask him. You don't have to beg him. You don't have to say, God, turn this around. Why? Because the scriptures are clear. Uh, Proverbs, sorry, Psalms 84, uh, verse 11b or the latter part of that scripture and it says, no good thing shall be withheld from those that, up, that walk uprightly. What does that mean, Mr. Ewing? God is saying, as long as you walk according to my will, nothing that will benefit you in this life will be hindered, will be delayed, will be kept back from you. By default, you will have it. Mighty God, I love it. 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 The Bible says, according to... Uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 24. Listen to what it says. All rules. It says, the fear of the wicked shall come upon them. My God. Listen though. But the desire, I love that piece. The desire of the righteous 
who, what's the qualifier here? The righteous. Who's the righteous? The righteous is the person who's doing it the way that God requires it according to his word. He isn't adding. He isn't taking away. No. Do it exactly like this, Kevin. And by default, I will meet your desires. My God, I love it. Oh, Lord, this, this is just too juicy this morning. I, I love it. I love it. So, so, so all you could see here is God is just in anticipation. Why don't my people agree with me? Why don't they do what I just tell them to do? They're all about doing a bunch of nonsense to try to win my favor when my rules are crystal clear. Why are they doing something totally opposite to it? So now back here up to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. He says, why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Temporal. These Mercedes and nice cars and homes, and I'm not saying you shouldn't get them. Yes, God will automatically give you them if you're doing his will. But don't let that become your source or your joy. No, 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 no. No, your joy should be that. You know what, God? I, I'm happy that I'm coming into the revelation that I don't have to pine and cry and do all kind of stuff to get your attention to do such and such for me. The only thing you require me to do is to come in agreement with your word. Oh, I love it. The Bible is clear according to Matthew 18 verse 19. He says, wherever two or more of you touching anything or agreeing with anything on this earth that you shall ask in my name, Jesus said of the Father, it shall, not might, it shall be done to you. Every scripture will be saying the same thing over and over. God is trying to get his people to agree with him and not these charlatans who's trying to tell them a whole new different spin on the scriptures. So he says, do not focus on the temporal things, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now let's put a pen right there. I said to you earlier, there are two worlds. There's the spiritual world, the one we cannot see. And there's the physical world where we exist on and the other worlds, Mars and so on, that we can see. All right. The scripture here, not Kevin, the scripture has made it very clear. It says, but the things which are not seen, he's talking about the invisible realm. He's talking about the spiritual world. He's talking about the unseen world. Listen carefully. He said, those things over there are eternal. So what does that mean? Like I've been telling you all along. So when you leave, when you exit your physical suit, because this is what makes you legal on this planet, this same flesh right here. Because the day your spirit and soul exit this, that is it. According to Hebrews, it is appointed unto man. How many times to die? Three, four, five? No, once. And after that, what happens? There's a judgment. But where is he going? He's going to a place that is eternal. Okay, there's no breaks there. That's an ongoing, perpetual place. So he's saying to us, Paul is telling the church of Corinth, listen, focus on the more heavier matters. And the heavier matters are the things that you cannot change, the things that are eternal, which you have no choice as it relates to your uh, eternity. Meaning that whether you go to live with uh, Christ or you go to live in the kingdom of darkness, in both cases, according to scripture, are eternal. All right? Now, let's go quickly to Ephesians chapter 6. Okay? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to read from verse 11. All right? Because again, Paul is giving some more spiritual nuggets. Now he's talking to the church of Ephesus. He just laid all spiritual nuggets on the church of Corinth. And this guy is just traveling and, and he's on the same journey of getting the saints to focus on the unseen realm. So Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God uh -huh, that you may be able, this is powerful, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, before we go any further, let's deal with the last word in that sentence. Devil. Is the devil physical? No. Is he tangible? No. Is he spiritual? Yes. So if Paul is asking us to put on a, uh, the armor of God, clearly, this is not a physical suit. But this is the part I want you to get in this, 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 this particular scripture. 
He said, first of all, who is he speaking to? Paul is speaking to the believers of Jesus Christ, the church of Ephesus. He isn't speaking to uh, unbelievers or people who worship pagan gods. He is His letter is addressed to the church of Ephesus. These are Bible-believing uh, people, okay? Now, why am I making emphasis on that? Because he's telling the people who have already accepted Jesus Christ, okay, that they need to now outfit themselves with the whole armor of God. This is important because many people, many of you listening to me right now, figure, well, I'm saved, and that's uh, that's that's it for me. I don't have to worry about the devil. The devil can't touch me. Generational curses can't do this. Wake up, wake up, wake up, because why would Paul advise the believer who have accepted Jesus Christ to put on your spiritual armor, listen, listen, that you may, okay, stand against the wiles of the devil. So he's saying if you don't have it on, even though you are a believer, the enemy can overcome you. Mighty God. You all hear this? You all listen to this? See, this are, these are the nuggets that we need to learn for ourselves and stop walking about aimlessly in this world under the banner that I am a Christian and that ends all right there. So this explains now why so many Christians are defeated because they are not resorting to the rule book to see their authority, to see the armor, to see how they ought to behave themselves. And more importantly, how do we operate by the rules to be successful? My Lord, I love it. Lord, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. How do we? That's the key in anything in life. Everything is operated. It is governed. It is dominated by rules, laws, principles, ordinance, precepts, commands. Listen. There is even an order to disorder because everything is governed by a rule. People fail in life because they either they are ignorant to the rules or they dismiss the rules. But the day you master the rules of the scriptures, trust me, you will have victory after victory after victory after victory. And you're not living a superficial form of godliness. You're not just I'm a Christian because Brother Kevin passed here. So let me sing a couple. Uh, Blessed assurance song and, and tell him how good God is and all that nonsense. No, I don't need Kevin to show up because I believe the scriptures. I believe the rules. I come committed to the rules and now no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But don't tell me you say no weapon formed against you should prosper and then it should just not happen. No, 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 no. Are you following the rules? So the scripture says here, yeah, he's telling us in verse 11. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against, that you may be able, meaning that you will not be able if you don't have on the armor. All right. Then he dropped in verse two, and now he's going deeper. He's going deeper about these spiritual things. He says, For we, circle the word we, who is this we? Because it ain't for everybody. We, the believers, he says, we wrestle or fight not against flesh and blood. So he's saying, Kevin, listen. Mary, who was fussing with you and making life difficult for you and upsetting you, Kevin, let me be clear. Do not waste your time with physical Mary. Mary have a spirit of jealousy against you. Mary have a spirit of hate against you. Now, Kevin, I'm teaching you, folk, when you pray, remember what I told you in my rules, Kevin, I say to, 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 to bless those that curse you and pray for those that despitefully use you and say all manner of things against you. Then folks will jump up. Oh, no, but the Bible says suffer not a witch to live. See there? There you go again. There you go again. That's Old Testament. And that has been amended since then. Jesus says, yes, it was said. An eye for an eye, a tooth for two. Yeah, you had a right back then to, to smite them if they smite you. He says, but now I am amending the laws. People don't like laws, especially when they don't look like it can work in their favor. <laughs> he says, I'm amending the law. And he says that if they slap you, turn the next cheek. He said, they curse you. Listen, listen, for those of you who say, suffer not a witch to live. He says, when what does witches do? They send curses, right? Jesus said, if they curse you, did he say curse them back? He said, now pray for them to despitefully use you. Wow, that's heavy. It's heavy. You know why it's heavy to you? Because you're still in the flesh. You still got revenge. You need to get back on them. You still want to spike them again. 
you have yet to transition from a spiritually mental perspective that, hey, as a believer of Jesus Christ, I must look at things from a spiritual perspective. If not, the scriptures are going to be quite aggravating to me because it would appear as if it's not working in my favor. But the reality is all of these messengers of Christ, of Paul and, and, and all of these guys, they were trying to bring home the spiritual aspect of the journey that you are on until it's time for you to transition into the eternal realm, which is the spiritual world. So he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. So he's basically giving us a, 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 a view of the hierarchy of the kingdom of darkness in this particular verse in terms of uh, Ephesians 6 verse 12. So he's saying, listen, principalities and, and, and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness, these are all spiritual positions that demonic forces has arrayed and organize themselves to consistently fight, fight mankind. However, they're not gonna, the way that they're doing it is that they want, especially the believer, to get that believer to focus on the physical things that's going on in their lives or what's happening to them. That's what they want to do. Because when you do that, you automatically violate Ephesians 6 verse 12, which specifically and initially said to you, we, the believers of Jesus Christ, do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Do not. You should not be fighting at these people or fussing them or running over with nonsense with them because you, you should be uh, 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 discerning the spirit that's emanating from them. You should be praying in your heart, Father, I bind the spirit of hate in the name of Jesus. I come against this spirit, Father, God of pride. I subdue and reject every spirit of anger in me, okay, in me that want to respond to this poison over you, which spirit, the spirit that's using them. So you got to see that this evil for or these evil forces is trying to play everybody involved here but primarily trying to get the Christian to violate the laws of God. Why are they so adamant about it? They're adamant because they know by default, according to uh, Deuteronomy 28, verses 15, he says, but if you do not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, he says, if you do not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, then, then and only then shall these curses come upon you. So you see, when you disobey the word of God, you are automatically in covenant with the kingdom of Satan. And now they have the right to infiltrate your life and, 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 and rip it apart. All right. Now check out verse 13. Verse 13 is now going to reveal, okay, how important verse 11 was of Ephesians 6. Verse 11, remember what it says. He says, put on the whole arm of God. But in verse 13, he is reiterating. And the only time you would repeat something is one of two reasons. Either whom you're telling it to did not hear you, which is not the case here, or, or the importance of them knowing it. So he is reiterating it to them. It reminds me when I was a, a young boy, uh, young when I was much, much younger, and my mother would, 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 would go to work or whatever, and she would leave her instructions. Right? Initially, then when she gets to that door, she said, now listen to me carefully. I can say this again. If I don't meet my house clean and I come back, it can be me and you. So for her to reiterate that, she's sending a strong message to you. Okay? That if you don't want to spend the night in the hospital, you better do what she asks you to do. Okay? Very, very clear. So this is why people will repeat. Either you couldn't hear them the first time, you didn't hear them, or, or, or they're making the message clear. So in verse 13 of Ephesians 6, he says, he said, wherefore, take unto you, again, the whole, the key is the whole, not a piece of it, the whole arm of God, which is an invisible spiritual suit, that you may be able to stand or withstand, listen, in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So he's saying, not if, but when, the, when the evil day come, that's inevitable, that coming. So he says, but I'm giving you the key points to focus on, to be prepared. Put on, pray it on. Father, I put on my helmet of salvation, my breastplate of righteousness, my shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the evil one, my sword, which is the living word of God, my belt of truth and my shoes, 
shod with the preparation of the peace of the gospel, I have just outfitted myself with the spiritual armor of God. You should never go to bed at night and not including in your prayer, putting on the arm of God. You should never leave your house or get up in the morning without putting on the arm of God. Because in both scriptures, it says to you that it, it, it that you may be able, meaning that you will not be able to combat the forces of the devil, even though you have Jesus Christ, if you fail in following the instructions given by our brother Paul. All right? Now, I have a lot more to cover. But I'm going to end right here. I'm going to give you this last scripture. I just want to give it to you in a nutshell. I'm going to give you this last scripture to bring all of what I have said so far to reality. Everything I've said to you, I'm about to bring it all together in one scripture right now. Okay, so let's quickly go here to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6, all right? And we're going to begin at uh, verse 15. Again, to give some background on this uh, particular story. The story is about our brother Elijah, E-L-I-S-H-A, and his servant, I believe his name was Gehazi. They don't, they don't mention his name yet, but I believe that's the one. And the Bible says how uh, they had fled to Dothan, a city called Dothan, and the Syrian army was behind them because Elijah was prophesying to Israel, advising them the ambushment that Syria was setting up against them to 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 attack them. So the Lord will reveal to Elijah where they were setting their traps and Elijah will in turn alert the armies of Israel. So the captain of Syria was trying to figure out how is it that Israel will always know when we come to attack them and change their route. He said there must be someone in our camp who's revealing this, this, this secret. So one of the soldiers says, no, no, master, it isn't anyone here. This, this, this fellow this, this, this fellow over here in Israel by the name of Elijah, he, he's the one who somehow has some kind of access. I don't know how, and he knows what's happening. So they decided to get their horses and chariots and all the, the physical means to now go and deal with Elijah. Because they figure if we shut down the spy, as far as they were concerned, then Israel will never know when they're coming to attack them. So, Picking up the story in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15, it says, And when the servant of the man of God, this is Elijah's servant, was risen early and gone forth, behold, a house compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So what's happening here? Okay, so Elijah, Elijah is about 82 to 83 at this point. The young servant got up early in the morning, decides to go outside, could just stretch and get some nice morning fresh air. To his amazement, he saw surrounding them, the entire city, all of the horses and chariots and soldiers of the Syrian army. So he runs back inside and he says, Alas, Master, Elijah, the, the, the entire Syrian army is here. Now we are about to bring all my points together because you're going to see Elijah, if we imitate him, like I've been telling you so far, if we focus on the spiritual world, if we dismiss the fears, if we dismiss the, they might take my home, your husband or wife may, if you dismiss all of this and focus on the invisible part of it, not only will you be fearless, but you will be more keen on the way forward. Oh, I love this. Yeah, my Lord, I love it. So going back over this again, 2 Kings 6 verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a horse compassed the city boat with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Verse 16, I love it. Verse 16 of 2 Kings 6 says, And he, who is this he? Elijah. Elijah answered and said, Listen, boy. Calm yourself down. You didn't deserve this. He says, fear not. Listen, listen. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Lord, Lord, I love this. I so love the scriptures. I love the scriptures. You all listen to this. First of all, right? If I was that young guy, and Elijah told me that, 
I would have had to search his bed and underneath the bed to see if this guy is drinking alcohol or he's high on drugs. Because I just told this fella, I said, look here, the whole the 60 billion people are here to kill us, okay? You 82, clearly you cannot help us. And I'm saying to you, these fellas come to kill us. And you talking nonsense, but I must fear. Not what you mean fear, not have every reason and right to be there. See, but Elijah, how we should be doing, he saw it from a spiritual perspective. Hence, his statement. So listen to what he said, because many people read, read this or would have read the scripture and missed it. Elijah is saying to him, all right? First of all, Elijah and the boy is party number one, right? The Syrian army is party number two. But in Elijah's statement, he's saying there are additional parties among them. So Elijah says to this boy, he says, listen, son, calm down. Listen to the statement. He says, son, there are more that are with us. So Elijah is saying that there is an invisible, in, sorry, an invisible group here to defend and fight for us. And this group, this invisible group, outnumber not just the physical army of Syria, listen, but also the invisible fourth party that is with them. So this is why he said in verse uh, 16 of 2 Kings 6, he says, and he, which is Elijah, answered, very calm, very eloquent. See, this is when you confident. He says, fear not, for they that be with us, that's the angels of the Lord. They that be with us are more, the angels of the Lord are more than they that be with them. So the demonic forces that are influencing the physical army of Syria, the scripture is unequivocally saying to us that the angelic hosts of the Lord outnumber them. Oh, I love it. I love it. Let's bring some more meat on these bones. The Bible says to us, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, he says, to which of the angels have I said at any point, sit here at my right hand, that while I make your enemies your footstool. None of them he said it to, but now he's about to, to dictate what their roles are. He says, are these angels not ministering spirits or serving spirits, but servants to who? To those who are heirs to salvation or heirs to deliverance. So who has qualified as an heir of salvation or heir of deliverance in Elijah and the boy case? Well, Elijah and the boy. So therefore the ministering spirits as clearly stated, in Hebrews 1 verse 14, okay? They, ha they had no choice. Why? Because Elijah is following the laws of God. Elijah is walking uprightly. Elijah is walking righteously. And what does all of that mean? They are walking according to the laws, the principles, the rules, and the ordinance of God. They are not going to see a juju man. They are not going to see a witch worker. They are not going to see a sanguma. They are not practicing any form of rituals and filth that has nothing to do with the Bible. They are not sowing seeds for miracles. They are not doing any of that. What they are doing is following the authentic word of the living God. So watch this. The story gets more interesting in verse 17 of 2 Kings 6. I love it. It says, and Elijah prayed. He had to pray because the boy at this point was wondering, listen, Elijah have to be high on drugs for the nonsense because the boy is looking at everything from a physical perspective. So you see how cloudy your view becomes when you still, as a believer of Jesus Christ, but you're assessing everything from a physical standpoint? You, you see how you're distracted? You see how you're so far off course? So Elijah says, okay, we need some intervention here. So in verse 17 of 2 Kings chapter 6, it says, and Elijah prayed, but listen to what Elijah said. Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, listen, behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots. Listen, listen, of fire around about Elijah. Two things I want us to take away from this in this particular uh, verse. The Bible says that Elijah prayed that his eyes be opened, that the young man's eyes be opened. What you mean? Was, didn't the boy tell you exactly what his eyes saw? Yes, he told 
Elijah exactly what his physical sight perceived. But what Elijah is petitioning God to do is to open his spiritual eyes. My Lord. And how do we know this? Because now when the boy goes back outside, yes, he still sees the Syrian army, but now we see horses and chariots that have nothing to do with the Syrian army. These horses and chariots are well, horses and chariots of fire. This is now a spiritual thing that he could not see before. Lord, I submit to somebody who ain't on this line by accident this morning. God has torn you in to let you know to stop looking at your physical circumstances and becoming all bent out of shape. Get back into the word of God and ask him to open your spiritual eyes so that, you, so that you could see the real reality of your situation. Because if you do not see the real reality of your situation, then the confession and the nonsense that you are running on right, right now and the negative foolishness you're talking about, you are, you are by default coming in agreement with the kingdom of darkness. The rules are very clear, okay? And it says that death and life resides where? In the power of the tongue. So if you're making stupid comments such as, uh, nothing never good happens for me. There are no more good men out here. All of these women are bad. Jesus, you, you put one step forward, you take two back. I broke like this. And no, 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 no. You are coming in agreement with the evil forces that has influenced you to say that mess because they are seeking. The spirit of poverty is seeking an agreement from you. The spirit of backwardness is seeking an agreement. But you don't know this. You don't know this. You don't know this. What you do know, though, is that, hey, this December again, and we need to sow seed for a better life next year. The devil is a liar. If you are not abiding by the laws, the rules, the principles, and the ordinance of God, you are just as fool as those who are telling you that you could circumvent the laws of God and pay God money for God to change your circumstances. What you need to do if you are so seed, show the word of the living God. That's what you need to sow. So I'm saying to you, I'm talking to everybody near and far. You need to, you need to immerse yourself in the word of God. Right now, Father, open my spiritual eyes. Father, forgive me for violating your laws. Father God, remove the hate. The spirit of hate has dominated my life. The spirit of unforgiveness, the spirit of pride, the spirit of offense. Father, I didn't know they were spirits. I just thought this was just me. I now am coming into the knowledge, Lord, that while we live in a physical world, we coexist with the spiritual world. And by succumbing to these things, I was giving these demonic forces the right to dominate my life. But no more. Why? Because your word is clear according to Proverbs 11 verse 9b. And it says that through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Lord, I love it. He says through knowledge not seed sowing, not spin around, give your neighbor high five, dance and carry it on. No. He said, are you applying the word of God? Are you applying the knowledge that you are receiving to break the shackles, the chains, to break the fetters, to yuck up the spiritual anchors and remove the spiritual hurdles out of your life? So now you could go forward and proceed and advance and to be catapulted into your destiny. But it will never happen. If you have been taken away from the word of God, you will never see it in this life. I am saying to you, let me calm down a little bit. Get a little excited here. Let me calm down a little bit, all right? All right, that's how, that's how I get sometimes. Because listen, you're, 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 you're listening to a man who is constantly on a daily basis living what God has promised. Why? Because I came to the knowledge. I had to unlearn a lot of stuff. I walk away from that garbage. Why? Because all it was doing was keeping me in a perpetual cycle of depression, defeat, backwardness, prone for the wrong relationship, rejection, you name it. But the day I decide to engage the laws of the living God and remove all of the theatric and pomp and pageantry and just believe his word, I saw things change for me. And to this day, this day, I never look back. Got no reason to look back because the word of God is yea and amen. What does that mean, sir? All that simply means if you follow the laws of God, there ain't no committee. There is no need for a council. There is no need for a board of, to di of directors to determine that you should receive the good. No. God says if you do my word, then my whatever you desire according to my will will be automatic in your life. The proof of this is in Matthew 6 and 33. What does it say? It says, seek ye first. What again? What again? The kingdom of God. And do what? And his righteousness. In other words, seek the kingdom of God. And now 
ascertain or seek the way that he wants things done in his kingdom. And he said, as a result of that, these things that you were once running behind will now run behind you. I am living it. I am living it. You, you ain't talking to some man who, who just, who just know how to quote scripture. I am living it and I am encouraging people for once in your life, put your all into the word of the living God. Dismiss what people have been telling you. You have seen it year after year. It does not work. Are they adding to the word of God? Are they taking away from the word of God? Whenever you spot that, stop trying to take up for some preacher, some teacher, or some apostle. They are violating scripture. And therefore, if you are violating the scripture, then the scripture cannot produce the promises that it promised you. God will not circumvent, bend, alter, delete, or augment his word just for you. Because if he's going to do that, then he owes everybody in hell an apology. And that will never happen. So I submit to you. Focus on the spiritual world. Let whatever you're dealing with, ask God. Lord, reveal to me. Lord, I think I get it now. Reveal to me, Lord. Just like how you open the eyes of Elijah's servant, Lord, open my eyes. Open my eyes about this marriage. Open my eyes to my finances. Open my eyes about this person I'm about to marry. Okay, somebody on this line right now, you're contemplating, even though you don't make the plans to be married, but still there's something saying to you, boy, I don't know if I should go into this. Ask the Lord to open your eyes about this person. You're probably about to sign on to a generational curse right now that was never part of your family, but because you are about to become one with somebody who's showing you something beautiful from the outside, but you don't see the evil on the inside. Mighty God, I'm talking to someone today. I'm talking to someone today. Again, Father, open their eyes so that they may see. And that's me, Jackie. Oh, yes, we thank you so much. We thank you so much. It was awesome. Thank you, <laughs> Minister Kevin Ellie Ewing out of the Bahamas, giving us a teachable moment here this morning. Yeah.